Hi, um, so everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, to join our um, single cell sequencing um, in cancer research uh, webinar at uh, ESHG. And um, it's um, new, very new technology, single cell sequencing. And uh, today we have uh, the honor to have uh, Dr. Reinhard Buchner uh, to give us an introduction on his view and his experience of how single cell sequencing can be used in cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, potentially. And uh, a couple of words about uh, Professor Dr. Reinhard Buchner. Um, he's uh, the professor and chairman for pathology at the University of uh, Cologne in Germany. And uh, Dr. Buchner is also a member of the German National Academy for Science, uh, the Leopoldina, and also Academy uh, Mongutia, and also Academy for Science uh, at the NRV um, state. And uh, he's a, a world well known a prominent uh, pathologist who has pioneered the applications of NGS and also other breakthrough technologies in clinical applications. Uh, after completing his MD study at um, uh, Ludwig Maximilian University um, uh, Munich, uh, Dr. Buttner received postdoctoral uh, training at uh, both uh, Gene Center at Munich and also MD Anderson's Cancer Center uh, in Houston. And uh, he's a member of the, yeah, as mentioned, um, a lot of uh, prestigious academy and also um, associations and um, uh, he's also the founding president of the Vladimir um, uh, Totovic uh, Foundation uh, for German Pathology. And uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Buttner to share with us um, his experience and his view on how single cell sequencing can be used for cancer research and uh, potential clinical applications. Um, Dr. Buttner, it's your turn now. Yeah, now everything is working. Thanks. Um, and the, the subject is single cell sequencing, a new dimension in cancer diagnosis and treatment. And we have an identical manuscript that uh, published recently this March in uh, 2021 in Nature Communications. And I would like to go in a little bit and uh, show um, where, where we are moving. Now, I hope I can move my slides. Um, yeah, um, uh, it's working. I would like to, yeah, I would like to state that this is a true collaboration between three sites with a new company, Singularon, providing a new technology for. Uh, single cell sequencing, Dr. Uh, Professor Chai Chun Chu's uh, group at Tongji University in Shanghai, and my group at the Network Genomic Medicine in Germany in Cologne. I would briefly uh, show you how do we diagnose and treat um, what algorithms are implemented in non-small cell lung cancers. Um, what are the drivers of heterogeneity posing problems? How can we catch them both genomically in stable tumors, but also uh, in, in uh, the interaction with immune systems under immune therapies and how we get uh, deep insights into better diagnostics by single cell sequencing? Um, um, <clears throat> oops. Um, Typically, we have uh, two major implications in, um, in when we, we diagnose a lung cancer. And the first is uh, lung cancer is driven by a number of very strong um, genomic alterations leading to activation of oncogenes, may it be receptors, may it be signal transduction molecules like KRAS or EGFR, and they are referred as oncogenic driver mutations. And these mutations can be treated with TKIs, 
Um, and uh, typically, um, that uh, area started about uh, 10 years ago when um, uh, TKIs are delivered, the tumor phenotype adapts and uh, the tumor relapses with um, uh, uh, resistance to the TKIs, the most frequent uh, resistance mutation that, that um, is observed after first generation and second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor is the T790M mutation. That will relate to all oncogenic driver mutations where we see pathway mut uh, mutations leading to resistance. On the other hand, we have um, since several years immune therapies at hand, very potent um, monoclonal antibodies that inhibit important checkpoints. And the checkpoint inhibitor that has made it into the clinic is PD, uh, monoclonal antibodies against PD-1. And uh, we have now several categories of um, uh, immune therapies with PD-1 antibodies. That is tumors that have a high expression of the PDL1 checkpoint will be treated with a single uh, monotherapies with PD-1 antibodies. We have combinations, and now we have uh, also approved uh, PDL1 antibodies, atezolizumab, also in combination with chemo and VEGF um, antibody, and also combinations of several immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so what are the problems? Why we, de we need deeper and more diagnostics? First of all, um, as I said, um, we have this um, resistant mutation for the oncogenic drivers. Um, and uh, these mutations, the most frequent mutation is T790M, but there are also activation of other pathways. And we have now established five different therapy lines um, for um, for uh, T, uh, EGFR TKI. Um, and um, there are combinations with, uh, um, uh, with uh, third generation TKIs, there are combinations with VEGF inhibitors, and, um, and um, there are also combinations uh, with um, a monoclonal, a bivalent monoclonal antibodies. Um, Sorry, can you move back? Can I help a technical assistant and move back my slides? Go back two more slides. Um, so we have now for many, many oncogenic driver mutations, we have um, we have um, several combination therapies. May it be a first generation TKI with chemotherapy and a, a first generation TKI with a VEGF a receptor antibody. And this is shown one more, please. One more back. Um, this is shown um, uh, in this slide. Yeah. So we have the first generation uh, that had a um, um, progression-free survival of roughly eight months. Then we had um, um, the combination therapies with VEGF antibodies that has a um, um, uh, duration of 18 months. We have the third generation TKIs, um, and uh, we have now the bivalent uh, um, study with an antibody that recognizes MET and activated EGFR plus a third generation TKI. The study is not completed yet, but probably will have a, an overall response um, for more than um, 20 months. I apologize um, for these technical problems with moving the slides. Um, can I help for tech? Yeah. Uh, one very important um, problem that we elicit is tumors that have P53 mutations, because P53 mutations render tumors under therapy genomically instable. And here you can see tumors that have a very potent genomic driver lesion. These are tumors we published with ALK inhibitors, alectinib. It's a very strong TKI. And as you can see that the green tumors that have a co-comitant P53 mutation have an overall progression-free survival and an overall survival under a TKI of only one-third in comparison to the blue tumors that have a P53 
wild type status. And, and therefore, um, um, it is clear that tumors are genomically instable, and we have analyzed this with a pan uh, uh, chromosomal stability methods, and you can see that some tumors are super instable. For example, this tumor with a p53 mutation treated with an ALK inhibitor has a, an amplification during therapy of 25, almost 25 mic copies. Um, and uh, this tumor has an amplification of TERD and so forth, and that therefore these tumors uh, elicit heterogeneity in different parts of the tumors and amplify genes that make them resistant to the therapy. Like a high-level MIC amplified tumor will not respond to any therapy any further. Um, can you, um, and, and, and another new um, very important development uh, coming into clinics uh, from last year on are the KRAS inhibitors. Worldwide, KRAS mutations are the most important um, um, oncogenic driver lesion. And however, KRAS tumors are genomically under stress and elicit a large heterogeneity. And therefore, we have tumors that are dependent on uh, ERK signaling. Others are dependent, dependent on ACT signaling, on STAT signaling. And hence, the response of uh, these tumors to very specific um, uh, inhibitors that attack the cysteine in the mutated KRAS is very heterogeneous. And the drug is only approved from second line therapies onwards. Um, because the overall objective response rate is only one third because the tumors have this huge uh, genomic um, instability and heterogeneity. And finally, <clears throat> um, that is a, a very important problem that we encounter under immune therapies. As I said, um, treatment with PDL1, um, PD1 antibodies and PDL1 antibodies is now approved worldwide. And depending on the PDL1 expression status, the tumors respond very well in the first line therapies in combination with chemotherapy, and they respond less well when PDL1 is not expressed. When these tumors relapse and after one year, probably 50% of the patient have relapsed. There is hardly any current good uh, second, third line therapies for these patients because immunotherapy has been used, chemotherapy has been used, and they have no oncogenic driver lesion typically, except for those that have a KRAS mutation. So um, it would be very nice to understand from the tumor microenvironment what to do with these patients and select them for personalized therapies and further lines. And um, therefore, we have um, used the technology, the new technology from Zingleron to go for single cell uh, sequencing. I'm trying to move my slide now. Um, and um, this uh, technology um, um, uh, can be used to expand the use of immunotherapies to understand why are tumors relapsing, to optimize patient stratification, uh, to also distinguish hyperprogression from pseudoprogression. That is a severe clinical problem because tumors under immune checkpoint therapies can elicit pseudoprogression. The tumors get larger because lots of immune cells infiltrate the tumors and um, they cannot, in the first uh, months, they cannot well be distinguished from tumors that do not respond and have hyperprogression. Um, and the, the question then is how to overcome a primary resistance. Um, so, um, um, we, we uh, together with uh, the group from the Chonji Univers University, we were able to sequence late stage lung cancers. And um, the question is, um, why is that uh, something new? Because there are lots of data in the literature already on lung cancers using the current 10X uh, uh, technology. Um, and um, 
the problem is with the current technologies that um, need larger pieces of tissue. We have a lot of data, uh, data from early stage lung cancer. So, uh, and very little data from late stage, from the late stage lung cancers and the immunological and genomic transcriptomic landscape was is mostly absent uh, in the current data set. So using the technology uh, from uh, Singleron, we were able to generate um, to generate as uh, transcriptomes from small core biopsies. And that is the prerequisite to use the diagnostic, the real life diagnostic material from these patients. Um, and um, we generated more than 90,000 transcriptomes from 90,000 cells with 11 major cell types and a lot of uh, cell subtypes. And the first, um, uh, the first um, question was, uh, do the transcriptomes and the information we receive from transcriptome actually um, relate to the diagnostic, histopathological diagnostics? And the, the key message is yes, it does. The, the transcriptomic classification into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma correlates very well with the histopathological diagnostics. Only a few tumor had to be reclassified based on the uh, transcriptome profile. So they were reclassified from an NSCL, uh, NSCLC diagnosis to an adeno or squamous cell carcinoma diagnosis. And there was only one discrepancy uh, showing that some um, lung cancer epithelial cells have an ambiguous morphology um, going into adeno and squamous cell carcinoma. That is known in the WHO classification, and these tumors hence are referred as adeno-squamous cell carcinomas. Now, um, so the, the conclusion from this data is that um, the, the correlation uh, between histopathology and the transcriptomic uh, classification is very solid as it is uh, in the case of a genomic classification. Um, the second question was, um, um, can we measure tumor heterogeneity? Sorry, can you move back my slides? Can you move back two slides? And uh, what we saw is that um, indeed by the width of the transcriptomes, the similarity of the transcriptomes, uh, we um, were able to, um, to measure intratumoral heterogeneity. And we saw uh, two very important new insights, which I personally, as a pathologist, a diagnostic pathology, had not expected. Um, and the first, um, the first um, 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 uh, key insight was that lung squamous cell carcinoma had a much larger tumor heterogeneity uh, as compared to adenocarcinomas. Uh, typically, um, um, typically the squamous cell carcinomas look histologically very similar. However, since there is an absence of um, strong drivers in squamous cell carcinomas, we see a large heterogeneities, and these tumors are more difficult to capture. And that is probably also the reason why these tumors escape from therapy much easier than uh, tumors that, uh, that are typical adenocarcinomas under strong oncogenic drivers. However, we have to check this again in the Western European cohort because the East Asian uh, patients have much higher rate of EGFR mutation in adenocarcinomas than the Caucasian patients. And therefore, this uh, situation may be different in different types of tumors uh, from different parts of the world. Secondly, also the, the intra um, Inter uh, heterogeneity in the tumor was increasing from early stage cancers to late stage cancers, which is an important message and also relates to the clinical experience that uh, chemotherapy is 
much more difficult in the late stage uh, tumors than in the early stage tumors. And uh, another important um, information came from analysis of the uh, tumor infiltrating immune cells. Um, and these immune cells um, uh, showed um, um, typically for the CD8 positive cells in the majority of immune cells an exhausted phenotype. And therefore, it is clear that not every tumor that has a lot of T cell infiltration uh, and not every tumor that has a high expression of PDL1 will respond very well to uh, an, an IO therapy with a PD1 antibody because an exhausted T cell is not to be reactivated by a single PD1 antibodies. So, um, um, uh, so the, the capturing of the individual uh, immune cell type um, in, in these uh, tumors is a very important information. And we can see whether exhaustion is uh, re related, for example, to the expression of uh, TIM3 or LAC3 or the expression of TGIT. And therefore, with the upcoming now new therapies where you have combination therapies with several immune checkpoint inhibitors, so is, uh, uh, for example, um, nivolumab and ipilimumab, but also TIGIT antibodies, also LAC3 antibodies, this single cell sequencing will allow to rationally select these patients for specific combinations therapies. And the last message that was also very surprising uh, to me was the strong interaction of, of stromal cells uh, with cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment. And that is shown on this slide where patient um, where the stromal cells expressed a PDGF um, uh, signaling to PDGF receptors in the tumor and also there was a strong axis between FGF and FGF uh, receptors and uh, cytokine and cytokine receptor interactions. So these are immune suppressive uh, signals provided by the stroma and those are very important to capture, to select patients for therapies. So um, we were, um, um, I think we were able to, to um, to profile tumors within the tumor microenvironment to a much deeper degree than previously thought. We could um, sort of measure precisely the genomic heterogeneity. That is an important prognostic information. We provide a new atlas of late stage non-small cell lung cancers within the tumor microenvironment. There's a new intratumoral heterogeneity algorithm, and uh, we have currently are performing studies to, to assess whether there is a good correlation between the duration of response and the development of intratumoral heterogeneity. And uh, we will um, um, perform uh, currently the, uh, the NCT uh, in Germany performs clinical trials where patients are treated with combinations of immune cells and based on the transcriptomes from the immune cells in the tumor microenvironment, it will be possible to precisely select patients, let's say for PD-1, LAC3 uh, combinations. <clears throat> so um, um, the, the, the single cell sequencing analysis provides uh, potential new biomarkers for both immune checkpoint inhibitors and targeted therapies for late stage uh, uh, cancers. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I would uh, like to thank this exceptional and uh, very fruitful co uh, collaboration between Singleron in Shanghai and in Cologne, and the collaboration with the group from Professor Jai Chun Chu at Yonji University Shanghai. And uh, I would also like to thank um, all our patients that are contributing in these important clinical trials. And um, as I said, um, we would not have been able to perform that study uh, without the new uh, Singleron technology that allows to use very small diagnostic biopsies uh, for generating this landscape of tumors in the tumor microenvironment. So 
the conclusion was technology matters, and uh, Dr. Nan Fang will now um, um, show you and uh, uh, the new technology for single cell RNA focus scope. And um, I'm very happy that you can present the technical details on that. in cancer research and potential uh, clinical applications. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the talk, um, it's really a great pleasure to see uh, such a uh, large audience um, uh, Sunday afternoon uh, to attend uh, our uh, webinar session. And if uh, from the audience, if you have any questions, uh, you can, prob uh, you can uh, please uh, submit it uh, through the Q&A. And uh, we will have at the end of this talk about like uh, 15 minutes uh, Q&A session, and we will collect all the questions and then um, our um, speakers, including myself, um, and um, and also, of course, uh, Dr. Buchner will be able to answer those questions and have discussions with you. Okay, uh, and now, um, as uh, Dr. Buchner just mentioned, uh, we think technology matters, and we have also been seeing uh, this really uh, good collaboration between technology and uh, clinical developments in the last 20 or so years from NGS, uh, to single cell sequencing and uh, probably uh, to even more advanced technologies uh, in the near future. And uh, today I would like to also present a very new technology and product uh, that we just developed at Single Run uh, Focal Scope. Um, it's a single cell multi omics um, analysis uh, that can simultaneously analyze uh, genetic variants and also transcriptomes. Uh, at single cell level. Um, just a brief introduction on the company. So we are a company that's uh, dedicated to developing uh, single cell technologies and products. And the company was founded in 2018, so relatively young. And right now we have more than uh, 400 people in the company and uh, serving um, altogether uh, more than 800 labs uh, worldwide. And uh, we develop, design, develop, and um, also manufacture our own products uh, for single cell sequencing uh, that includes uh, automated uh, instruments, uh, microfluidic systems, uh, reagents, and also bioinformatic um, solutions and database. And uh, we have locations uh, in China, um, and uh, we also just started um, our uh, service lab as well as um, R&D site um, in Cologne, Germany. And uh, we also have a, a site for early technology development in the US. So you can find us um, in three continents already. And uh, we, um, we are aiming to bring um, groundbreaking single cell analysis technologies to clinics. And uh, that's also why um, it's such a, it has been such a pleasure and also honor to uh, be able to work with uh, clinical experts uh, like Dr. Buttner. And uh, just to give you a brief overview of our technology, so our, uh, the core of our technology is uh, based on microplate, um, microfluidic system. Uh, so to use this kind of microwell-based microfluidic system, uh, we can partition cells uh, into each individual well. And uh, then um, in those wells, we uh, label or we barcode each uh, single cells uh, with uh, barcoding magnetic beads. And uh, because we design and also develop as well as manufacture our own barcoding beads, uh, as you can imagine, we can play around with it and uh, to decide uh, which kind of genetic materials we can get, uh, we should get from the single cells. And uh, another thing that I would also like to mention um, is uh, we have very flexible design of our microwave chips uh, so that it can accommodate uh, to different cell morphologies uh, from very small, for example, yeast cells uh, to large heart and brain cells. And uh, we also have a very flexible um, 
uh, throughput from 500 to 30,000 uh, cells uh, per chip without uh, sample barcoding. And with uh, sample barcoding, it could be up to 120,000 uh, cells per chip. And um, yeah, as I mentioned before, we offer a complete solution uh, from sample processing, in, uh, for example, tissue preservation, uh, tissue dissociation, and um, and uh, then single cell partition and labeling library prep and uh, to sequencing. So we don't have a sequencer yet, um, but then we have um, after sequencing also our telescope uh, data analysis pipeline as well as our synacrosis um, database uh, to really analyze single cell data and also to annotate the data and uh, give clinically relevant insights uh, to the data. And uh, yeah, so we, um, one of the, um, so on this uh, platform, uh, we keep developing new applications and uh, technologies. And uh, one recent um, question that um, uh, interested us uh, was, um, uh, as Dr. Buchner also mentioned in his talk, um, very, uh, with the development of next generation sequencing uh, methods and technology, uh, clinicians and also clinical researchers have been able to understand uh, the mutations uh, inside of cancer uh, better and better. And some of those mutations are driver mutations. And uh, for those, we can find uh, target therapies for them, or we can try to develop target therapies uh, for them. And uh, some of um, those other mutations might not be relevant um, at the first sight, uh, but we never know. And now we also have single cell mRNA sequencing technology uh, that can also tell us uh, the transcriptome or gene expression patterns uh, inside of each single cells. Um, so this actually brought us to some very interesting questions. Uh, so first, at single cell levels, uh, how are those uh, mutations distributed? Uh, uh, if a tumor has different driver mutations, are they in the same cells? Or are they in different single cells? And uh, whether it matters actually to have the mutations in the same or different subclones? Uh, so that would be a very interesting uh, question to answer. And another one is uh, also uh, what exactly those driver mutations are doing uh, inside of the cells and uh, whether we would see, for example, uh, gene expression patterns are drastically different uh, in the cells with versus without uh, certain driver mutations. And uh, to answer this question, and actually also um, the ideas um, evolved uh, through uh, discussions uh, also with uh, Dr. Buchner, and uh, we developed uh, the focal scope um, product uh, with which uh, on our cell barcoding beads, uh, we not only have oligo-DTs uh, to capture mRNA from each single cells, uh, we also can design and also uh, cap the beads uh, with uh, gene-specific uh, uh, probes uh, so that with the same uh, barcoding beads, uh, we can capture uh, mRNA as well as uh, targeted uh, genes of interest uh, from each single cell. And with that, uh, we can design, uh, for example, a lung cancer drug ball mutation panel uh, that can capture the drug ball mutations uh, that have been well known uh, to pathologists and also clinicians uh, together with mRNA um, uh, species uh, inside of single cells. And uh, here is just one example. We used uh, three different cell lines uh, to test and validate our technology. And uh, A549 has a KRAS uh, mutation. And um, uh, H1975 uh, has a EGFR uh, T1790M mutation. And uh, as you can see here, uh, with this technology and uh, with uh, lung cancer drug ball panel, we can distinct uh, distinguish those three different um, uh, cell lines, uh, we can also uh, correctly annotate uh, which uh, cell lines uh, has which uh, mutation. 
And as you can also see here, actually, even if you zoom it a little bit more closely, like inside of each cell, and you can also see some cells might have a higher um, expression of uh, certain mutations, and some other uh, individual cells might not uh, have the mutations from the cell line. And uh, we then, uh, after validating the uh, technology of the uh, kit uh, in cell lines, uh, we went on to test uh, some um, clinical samples. And as you can see here, uh, we took uh, some tumor tissue and uh, we ran them through the focal scope um, drug for lung cancer panel. And we looked at, so first, uh, based on the mRNA expression pattern from single cells, uh, we could make uh, different cell clusters. And uh, we could also annotate uh, which uh, cell types they are, whether those are uh, tumor cells, normal epithelial cells, or different uh, stroma cells and um, immune cells. And uh, after that, uh, we can also overlay the mutation information onto the cell types or onto the cell clusters, as you can see on the right side uh, of this panel. And uh, those mutations are annotated to only tumor cells, uh, as you can see in the middle. And uh, you can also see that not all tumor cells are equally um, containing this um, um, this EGFR exon 20 insertion mutation that uh, we could detect. And uh, this mutation uh, has been known to be responsible uh, for TKI resistance. And I, uh, we think that the knowledge uh, we have here uh, that we can generate could give us more clues on uh, why this mutation um, uh, can confer to the TKI resistance. And uh, also, by the way, the uh, results uh, we generated here with our panel was also confirmed um, uh, by deep sequencing of uh, WES to show that uh, the tumor sample indeed uh, has the mutations that we also detected at single cell level. And uh, another interesting analysis that we could uh, do was also to look at, um, at uh, a tumor a trajectory um, analysis uh, in which part, uh, at which stage of the tumor um, evolution uh, could this insertion mutation be uh, uh, concentrated. And as you can also see here uh, on the left side uh, showing the mutation, uh, we think uh, the mutation is uh, probably um, more concentrated, um, like at the later stage of the tumor evolution, uh, which could be uh, somewhat related uh, to its um, the mechanism of this mutation um, conforming the uh, TKI resistance. And uh, another uh, interesting uh, thing, because as you remember, we can design uh, our barcoding beads in such a way that uh, we can put different um, probes on top of the beads so that it can uh, capture different uh, genetic materials uh, inside of single cells. Another interesting application in cancer research uh, would be to capture viral RNA together with uh, host mRNA from uh, same single cells. Uh, because as you um, know, um, quite some uh, cancer types, um, they contain uh, specific uh, viral sequences and some of those virus uh, virin have also been shown to be uh, related or uh, even causal uh, to the cancer. And uh, so here uh, we actually uh, did uh, one um, feasibility study with the beads um, conjugated with uh, EBV specific uh, probes uh, in addition to mRNA uh, oligo DT probe uh, sequences. And here, um, proof of principle also with large cells uh, to show that we could indeed uh, capture EBV sequences and uh, analyze them. And, um, and because EBV has been known um, to play some roles uh, in blood cancer. Uh, so here for our case study, we looked at, we took uh, T-lymphoproliferative uh, disorder 
patient's uh, skin biopsy, and uh, then we run our uh, EBV plus MI panel through um, uh, the sample. And as you can see on the left side, uh, based on the MRA profiles, uh, we could um, uh, class the different cell types and um, and on the uh, right side, um, on the lower right panel, you can see uh, that uh, the EBV reads uh, could be detected um, and uh, in the T-like cells. And we could zoom in a little bit further and uh, we could recluster uh, all those uh, T-like cells and actually what we saw was uh, that uh, there were not only T cells, uh, there were also NK T cells. And also uh, for T cells, we also have two different populations, uh, naive T cells and proliferative uh, NK T cells. And uh, then uh, if we overlay uh, the T cell annotation uh, to the um, virus reads, uh, we could also see that actually in the proliferatory uh, NKT cells, um, most of those cells are EBV positive, uh, while in naive T cells, actually, the EBV positive um, uh, cell percentage is relatively low. And uh, we, we are also doing further studies um, with um, uh, data we have. Uh, uh, and we also think this could shed more lights on the mechanism of uh, this specific disease. And uh, just to sum it up, and uh, we think uh, focal scope, um, uh, our new multi-omics uh, single cell analysis tool uh, can add a new uh, further dimension to single cell analysis. And uh, we can design um, it in such a way so that in addition to the MRA and um, uh, gene expression profiles, uh, we can also detect, uh, for example, mutations uh, inside of uh, single cells or gene fusions. Uh, we also have data on those uh, that I didn't have time to show. Uh, we can also capture viral sequences uh, inside of single cells. And uh, maybe if you have some other ideas on what we can also capture inside of the single cells by um, different ways of designing the probe, um, you are very welcome to discuss with us. And uh, we also think this kind of multi-omics uh, integrated analysis at single cell level will give us really the very high dimension and also very high re uh, resolution of uh, information that can help us to understand uh, the mechanisms of uh, cancer much better and with that uh, hopefully to develop um, better therapeutic uh, strategies uh, for the cancer patients. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we also have our European site. It's in Cologne. You are very welcome uh, to visit us um, in Cologne. If you happen to be in the city, it's a very nice uh, city. And um, you can also drop us an email at uh, info at uh, singleroundbio.com um, or visit our LinkedIn or Twitter site and uh, give us um, feedback. And if you have any questions, uh, you are very welcome um, to submit your questions uh, via Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your attendance and your time on such a Sunday afternoon. And also, again, uh, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Brutner. And also, yeah, now uh, we are open for questions. Yeah, so uh, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A section and we will uh, pick it out and read it out, uh, re read uh, out to the speakers to answer it. So uh, maybe to uh, start with, uh, we have some questions also uh, for Dr. Brutner. Is, um, one of the question is uh, the the big topic of uh, tumors um, is the heterogeneity. And uh, very interestingly, from the single cell sequencing data, uh, we do see that uh, the late stage biopsies showed a huge, uh, not only intracellular 
intratumor uh, heterogeneity, but also interpersonal heterogeneity. Um, so question for Dr. Brunner is, do you see um, this uh, from a single cell profiling uh, result? Does this kind of uh, result reflect also what you see from a pathological um, a point of view? What is your experience on this? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Thank you for this question. I think we have to do more careful clinical trials integrating that data information. I think from bulk sequencing that is established what we do right now. We take a biopsy, then we sequence a number of X, Y, Z genes. And then we assume, let's say, a p53 mutation is present in the majority of tumor cells. <clears throat> we we can clearly see that some of the very important tumor suppressors um, are related to genomic instability, and that compromises the effects of therapies, and also um, um, is a prognostically poor predictor of outcome. Um, we are just, uh, we have a study right now um, that is under review in JTO, where we have retrospectively analyzed uh, roughly 15,000 um, um, sequencing so we did from, from early stage lung, ca uh, lung cancer patients, patients that got resected. And then you can clearly see that P53 mutated tumors but also tumors that have mutations in KIAP1 and SDK11 have a much, much higher chance to relapse and uh, lead to, call, uh, to death of the patient than resected tumors that are, have a stable genome and are wild type. And I think uh, single cell sequencing is indeed a um, very interesting tool to to assess also this intratumorous heterogeneity. And therefore, I have a question to Dr. Fang, um, because uh, it is a, <clears throat> it is possible from um, from uh, transcript homes also mm -hmm. to calculate copy number variations, which mm -hmm. can be the read out as genomic instability. Um, do you think that we in the future will do a single cell sequencing and then assay also regional differences in genomic instability? Because it's certainly not a black and white parameter that, let's say, from day 10 on, a tumor is 100% genomically instable. It's probably also a development mm -hmm. and you have tumor areas that uh, are different in terms of the degree of instability. Will that be possible to calculate from single cell transcriptomes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually we can. Uh, we just developed, um, I, I can show you probably in details offline, uh, we just developed a scoring system for CMVs at in each individual single cells. And uh, the resolution, of course, um, is dependent on the reads uh, we sequence uh, from each uh, single cell. And uh, if we um, would really like to have higher resolution on which regions have CMVs, uh, we might need to sequence a little bit uh, more than the currently uh, recommended 50,000 reads uh, per cell. But, um, but that's also possible. And uh, actually, we also, like with this new scoring system, uh, we also did some very interesting study regarding like detecting um, very minimal uh, cell, uh, cancer cell in a sample. Yeah, so that's definitely possible. And um, I think that's a very, uh, very good idea. And we also had our first uh, test and, uh, and it seems that it works, yeah. Okay, really nice. Um, yeah, I have maybe two more questions. Um, <laughs> One is uh, from this paper, uh, recently published uh, Nature Communication paper, uh, Dr. Brutner, one of the uh, results, I think, uh, is on the neutrophils. And I remember uh, before we 
with, we delved into the analysis, um, it was your idea at the beginning that we should look more into the neutral field population. Uh, what was your um, uh, reasoning behind it? And what do you see as the potential functions of neutral field population uh, in lung tumors? Yeah, in, in, in general, I think uh, the, let's say, typing the monocyte, the many types of monocytes that exist in, in a tumor is some is, is a new and fascinating area. Uh, currently, we are always, if we talk about tumor immunology, we're mostly looking at adaptive immune cells like cytotoxic T cells with the it's our idea that we could activate them somehow um, and vaccinate, and then these cells would be uh, more um, prone to to execute a cytotoxic uh, T cell attack. The fact is that some of the tumors, and I was a bit uh, I'm a bit sorry that some of my slides didn't show up very well, but some of the tumors actually have very very few uh, cells from the adaptive immune system. They are dominated by um, granulocytes and monocytes. And here, uh, key regulators of the innate immune system are much more important, which, um, which uh, sort of typically these monocytes acquire an immunosuppressive type and maintain tumor growth. So uh, there are so-called type 2 macrophage uh, phenotypes. And there are tumors, human tumors, that have practically eliminated all adaptive immune cells and entirely have an, an, an tolerance-inducing um, monocytic uh, immune cell infiltrate in the tumor micromyelia, for example, small cell lung cancers. And hence, in the current immune therapies and concepts are not working very well in these uh, tumors. Um, and it, we, we, I think by single cell sequencing, that will be a great chance to understand why are these cells missing or exhausted and not functioning uh, from the adaptive immune cells. I, I hope that we will have a much deeper insight. And uh, just to give you one, uh, one uh, flavor of of the thinking that the current clinical trials in small cell lung cancers are all based on the assumption that you can vaccinate against tumor neoepitopes. And that will never work because the, the executive axis um, of T cells, uh, plasma cells, B cells is not present in these tumors. And you mm -hmm. cannot, it's like, um, trying to grow something in the Sahara and water is absent. Yeah? It will never work unless you change the micro milieu. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that is the information we get from single cell sequencing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, um, mm -hmm. really insightful uh, <laughs> information. Really, really nice. So maybe my last question for uh, both of the speakers, uh, Dr. Fa and Dr. Brutner is also to the topic of today's um, webinar is uh, the future of precision medicine. So um, we talked about the potential uh, diagnostic potentials of single cell sequencing uh, technologies. Um, how far do you see um, how, or how soon do you expect to see this technology be adapted in clinics? Or how do we see, um, how would they shape the, or influence a little bit on the future of um, precision medicine? Maybe starting with Dr. Brunner. I think it will depend on careful clinical trials that integrate this diagnostics. Um, for, for example, we, we currently we have made only observations like uh, genomic instability driving to escape from therapies, shorter response duration, sh uh, shorter overall survival. The question is, uh, will, for example, 
addition of a chemotherapy to an ALK inhibitor in a genomically instable tumor at something good? That is a question I cannot answer until we do a, a careful clinical trial with biopsies before and after. And the, the power of the single cell uh, sequencing technology is that we can also assess the effect of the therapy on the genomic um, features like genomic stability, the damage. Um, and um, currently, I think many oncologists think the more therapy, the better. I'm not sure whether that is uh, is something that will um, will hold true in these uh, trials. And it may be that a genomically instable tumor doesn't benefit very well from a therapy that drives instability, further instability. We have to do clinical trials to to answer your question faithfully. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Fong, do you have any insights on that as well? Yeah, um, I, I think we, yeah, we are now in the face of uh, collecting um, uh, more data and also more proof uh, to really move this new technology uh, to um, uh, real clinical applications. Um, I, uh, on that point, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Bütner. Um, and um, the positive sign is uh, that we see a lot of clinical trials and clinical studies uh, involving single cell sequencing uh, from like uh, pharma companies and also from researchers. And uh, we uh, uh, ourselves are involved already in two such clinical studies. Um, uh, one is in combination with a phase three clinical trial of a combi uh, combination of PD-1 antibody and uh, chemotherapy for late stage um, non-small lung, uh, non cell lung cancer patients uh, who failed uh, TKI treatment and who has uh, EGFR driver mutations. And uh, that one we just closed um, uh, with our partners, and uh, we are now in the process of analyzing the data, and uh, we really expect that would uh, give us more insights. And we recently also started um, clinical trial collaboration uh, with um, another um, pharma company doing mRNA-based uh, uh, therapy. And uh, this one is um, just kicked off. And we also hope uh, that would also give us more um, information. And I think there are also uh, many other people trying in this um, uh, direction to have well-designed um, uh, studies and also with those uh, to really um, deliver more uh, insights, uh, more data, more information, and also more insights. Um, but I personally feel that um, getting single cell sequencing to clinics might be um, much quicker than people. Uh, think, especially with also the uh, experience of the clinical and also research community with uh, bringing next generation sequencing to clinics, which is another complicated um, technology and also very new at uh, the time. And Dr. Buchner was, I remember, maybe one of the first um, clinicians in Germany or in Europe uh, who really applied uh, that for um, routine clinics and um, yeah, so we are very hopeful and positive about uh, the future of uh, single cell analysis in uh, clinics. Okay. Okay. Excellent, excellent. So uh, due to the uh, time limits, I think uh, we will close today's uh, webinar and we really appreciate and thanks everybody for spending your a Sunday afternoon with us. We hope uh, you uh, get uh, interesting information from this. And if you have any additional questions, you can always write uh, to our company or write to Dr. Bittner for detailed discussions. And with that, we would like uh, to thank uh, both speakers, uh, Dr. Bittner. Uh, thank you so much for for your time and. Uh, and Dr. Fang uh, for your insights onto the technology. 
And with that, thanks everyone and have a great Sunday afternoon. Yeah, have a nice week or rest of weekend. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice weekend. Yeah. Bye bye. bye.